Um, George Johnson, are you? John, hey. <laughs> how, are, how are you doing? It's been a while, George. Good. How have you been, John? I've been pretty good. And um, George, I've got a, uh, a pretty heavy question to put to you this morning. Oh, okay. Do you think that there are any people who will watch us on Blogging Heads TV, even if they believe the world is going to end on that day? Oh, I'd like to think. I'd like to think that the scoffers will. <laughs> or they won't be here. So, of course, that's the dilemma. Right. We, we should, we should uh, provide some context, maybe, for anyone who doesn't know that it's been predicted that tomorrow, which is today, when people are watching this, will be May 12th. And uh, the rapture will occur, and uh, all of the non-believers will be left behind, and the believers will rise to heaven, including those in the grave who will be, you know, bodily, bodily resurrected and ascend and all that. And, and you and I, I know, will be will be down here, getting ready to suffer through the tribulation. And and I hope that some people, you know, would be viewing us. But then again, there's a chance it won't happen. You've got you've got. Five six hours to live, or uh, you know, the, the, there's an earthquake that is shattering the earth, and there are people flying up into space to uh, go visit Jesus, and yeah. and you want to watch George and John on Blogging Heads TV? I it'd, think it'd be an honor. Why not? Um, you know, you know, I hadn't really been following this, and then this morning, uh, one of the producers sang. Uh, said that they'd had a couple of special requests from Blogging Head staff members that we talked about the apocalypse, which I found rather flattering. And <laughs> and it reminded me, I mean, I, I really had not been following this one because, you know, they've just cried wolf too many times, these, mm -hmm. these, these people, and it never happens. And, you know, I get to where I don't follow it anymore. But I used to back when I was... Um, really writing a lot about conspiracy theories and, and really fringe fundamentalist movements. Uh -huh. I, I just dug out a book, the book that I wrote back then, it was called Architects of Fear, mm -hmm. Conspiracy Theories and Paranoia in American Politics. And there's a chapter called The Doomsday Plot. It's so funny to take out these things you wrote decades ago <laughs> and, um, you know, and see what you said. But... Um, yeah, this chapter begins with August 6, 1981, and some character named Bill Maupin of the uh, Lighthouse Gospel Tract Foundation in Tucson has predicted that uh, that uh, you know this is the same thing is going to happen that uh, you know all the people on Earth who believed in in Jesus would be uh, would be raptured mm -hmm. to heaven, and then the rest of us would uh, be left behind, and then of course the day came and went and nothing happened. And, you know, just looking back into that, there was a guy, you know, the Millerite movement? I've heard of it. I think maybe we've even talked about it. I bet we did. Here before. Yeah, just, just to briefly, briefly touch on it. It was the 19th uh, century. Let's see, October 22nd, 1844. Let's see. Is that right? No, sorry. It was March 21st, 1843 was supposed to be the rapture and apocalypse and all that. And then um, it didn't happen. So then Miller went back and he rejiggered his calculations and realized, you know, he made a made an error. It was actually October 22nd, the um, same year, 1844. And again, of course, it didn't happen. And then the people in his movement started to refer to that day as the Great Disappointment and... They were just bummed out for the rest of their lives. The great disappointment. Well, we all have yeah. our great disappointments, I suppose, and uh, some are more dramatic than others. Um, yeah. You know, but my... you know what fascinates uh, I'm sorry, um, I, just if I could continue with that thread, what, what fascinates me is the intricacies of the calculations mm -hmm. that go into this stuff. And I just briefly glanced this morning to see what, um, what this guy, um, what's his name? Oh, it's Scientific American. Oh, yeah, the no, the, um, the the apocalypse guy, Harold Camping. Oh, you know how he came up with this day, and it has something to do with coming up with a specific day for the biblical flood, which is like four thousand something B.C., which is of course you know flies in the face of geology, and then some reference to seven days, and then deciding that seven days are actually seven thousand years, and then there's something about 
accounting for the fact that zero hasn't been invented and, and you come up with uh, the tomorrow. But uh, I, I dug out something that I've had for years when I was writing Architects of Fear, and it's this self-published, I believe, book called uh, The Key to the Book of Daniel and the 40-Year Generation. And it's got this, just to give uh, viewers a sense of how intricate this stuff is, some of these calculations where they correlate Bible verses, like books of Daniel with books in Revelation, and it's, uh, you know, it's just absolutely amazingly intricate. The people who do this, they you know, just have these real needlepoint kind of brains, and they're just down there making all these little little connections, and uh, then they come up with these, these various dates. So a lot of work goes into this, and so far for not. Needlepoint brains, I love that. Um, <laughs> I, um, you, I, I, it is, it's, it's fascinating to uh, think about why these, these sorts of predictions keep uh, coming up. I, I have to admit that I'm a little bit susceptible to this sort of thing, too. In fact, I once had a, uh, I described this in my, um, my book, Rational Mysticism. I took this stuff called ayahuasca, which has a uh, psychedelic right. called uh, dimethyltryptamine, and I was um, standing on a, a bluff uh, overlooking the Pacific on, uh, you know, must have been about one or two in the morning, and I was, you know, stoned out of my mind. And suddenly, uh, the world was transformed. There was a moon out and um, over the water. And I thought that I was seeing the Earth way in the future, millions or billions of years in the future, and uh, it was completely dead. It was devoid of any kind of life. It was just oh. a cinder. And the uh, the moon, I uh, became like a um, a white dwarf. So the sun had had shrunken, and um, there was no longer enough uh, heat to sustain life. So you know, it was this kind of vision of heat death in the future, and I was, needless to say, really freaked out because I thought I was Jeez. really seeing the future, and then it occurred to me that before the sun could shrink down to a, a dwarf star, it had to go through the red giant phase, and <laughs> during the red giant phase, it would wow, incinerate. Wow, science writing pays off. <laughs> yeah, the earth would be incinerated during the red giant oh. phase, and so uh, it wouldn't exist at all, and so I realized that this was a total hallucination, and and uh, I shouldn't worry about it too much. Yeah, so your hallucination didn't allow for the intervention of an all-powerful god who could overcome the laws of physics. Uh, no, although, uh, you know, if I did believe in such an all-powerful god, I would have assumed that he would, uh, he would preserve life, uh, that, uh, you know, that we would have some exciting future for us, and not just... The death of, no, not just, no. what, what was fascinating about it, and I think this is what's interesting about these apocalypses, is that they represent, um, on a grand scale, our attempt to deal with our own mortality. So, you know, it's one thing to worry about our personal deaths, but to yeah. worry about the, the extinction, um, the end of all of humanity, that really is a challenge to your sense of what makes life um, meaningful. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. you know, we can still think of our ourselves somehow um, persisting in the future beyond our death through our works or people we know or children and, and those sorts of things. But it's, um, it's tough if you really think that there's no guarantee that humanity will persist. And there isn't. You know, yeah. of course, if you really believe. Well, not, not only is there not a guarantee, but if you're a fundamentalist Christian like the like like the guy who's making the latest predictions, you know, you believe it's ordained that that, that humanity, you know, the time is finite. That you know, since the fall, um, the fall in the Garden of Eden and all that, it's just been kind of downhill ever since. And you know, we're just waiting, you know, for Jesus to come back and um, and uh, put a stop to it all. Yeah, but it's it's so weird to think of. I mean, what then? You know. So then, the, the great adventure of life is over. Yeah, uh, but not if. Well, yeah, but if you're in heaven with all your, not only with your friends, but with your your deceased ancestors and and maybe even loved ones who died during your lifetime. So playing badminton you know, and and sipping uh, mai tais. 
Well, no, I don't think I don't think if you're a fundamentalist Christian, you're going to be you know you know see, I, you're singing you know hymns and things like that, and maybe communing communing with nature and, and the you know, the love of an all-seeing, all-powerful God. You know, similar to on Earth, but without all these you know these non-believers around doing creepy things and messing everything up. <laughs> well, I you know it's but I don't know don't. It, Go on. It, well, I, also, I just wanted to bring up, you know, when I, I started hearing about this, actually, from my kids last night, I, I like you, I was ignoring it, or I just thought, you know, I heard end of the world, and I thought, okay, people were talking about the 2012 prophecy for some reason. Oh, right, the Mayan calendar, that's... Yeah, I mean, that's going to be uh, here in about uh, 18 months, we're going to have to deal with that again. Um, oh, okay. So basically, the fundamentalists kind of had to get in, get in first, and kind of upstage the, you know, the the wacko Mayanist fundamentalists. The, the New Agers. I think I might have mentioned yeah. uh, on this show before that I um, interviewed this guy named Terence McKenna, who was at oh, least yeah. in part responsible for that 2012 prophecy, and said that he had uh, had this vision when he was tripping, and. Um, of the end of the world, and uh, and then he did some calculations based on fractal mathematics and predicted exactly <laughs> when it would happen, and it right. turned out that it was the exact same day that was predicted by the Mayan calendars and all this shit. And, oh, um, man. And, oh, of course, he was wow. just goofing. I got him to admit that it was uh, yeah. it was just a big goof. It was... Oh, great. It, it, the whole thing was an attempt to... Um, he would say all these crazy things, and uh, it was his way of, he would do anything to try to get people to realize how bizarre life is. Yeah, and uh, yeah. even if he had to say things that he didn't believe in, it was, huh. it was worthwhile just to try to grab people's attention. Yeah. But wow. uh, no, he didn't take it seriously. Well, of course, this, you know, I mean, many people are speculating that Harold Camping's, you know, primary motivation is to attract and donations to his uh, to his cause and himself and and yet I you know I, I just having talked to a lot of these people back when I was writing this book I suspect that he's really deep down in, in his bones believes this and has convinced himself of it and and it'll be interesting to see how he backtracks when it doesn't happen and comes up with another another date but uh, that reminds me I wanted to mention that totally coincidentally this week out of the blue, I got an email this morning asking me to do an online um, chat um, about conspiracy theories, but it was keyed to this thing with the, um, you know, the head of the IMF and the and the Sofitel hotel room rape incident. Really? And I guess you know conspiracy theories that are coming out of that, since this guy's you know the the uh, head of the IMF and the IMF often, I mean actually the IMF often figured into a lot of these. Uh, these biblical doomsday plots. These, really? um, yeah, because the IMF was like you know connected with the United Nations and one world government, and the same people read the Book of Revelations to be referring to one a one world government coming, and when that happens, that this is one of the signs that the end is about to come. Mm -hmm. And the one world government is led by the beast, and some people thought that the IMF was part of the one world government, and and, and the mark of the beast, you know, 666, of course, that opened up all kinds of numerological fantasies. And, uh, and the, my favorite, though, was this woman who thought the, the mark of the beast was the um, universal product code, you know, that was start, starting to appear back when she was writing this book on, um, on di different products, uh -huh. and that the, the beast would cause everyone to have a, a, have a similar universal product code tattooed on their hands, and you would have to use this for money. So it was like a, you know, a, a, a debit card tattooed to your skin, you know, which would be totally convenient. Yes, but it she would. Thought that this, and then this way, people who won't do this, see, you don't get one of these unless you bow down to the beast, and then you can't buy and sell in the economy, and as Revelation predict, you know, predicts, and you know, when you correlate this with various other books in the Old and New Testament, you can come to the conclusion that uh, this means that the, that the second coming is nigh in the rapture, so... So anyway, but anyway, we, it's funny, we were doing this discussion, I was doing it with an expert at a university, 
and I should say his name, but I haven't had a chance to even look at the results yet. And um, um, but I didn't even know when we were doing this about or re remember about this thing coming up, coming up. I keep saying tomorrow, but it's today for our viewers, and it would have been fun to include that. Mm -hmm. okay. But I'm rambling. That's quite a uh, <laughs> that, that's uh, that's quite a connection. I I, I assume that. The conspiracy theorists also would make much of the fact that this this IMF chief is uh, Jewish, because of course oh, yeah. you know Jews always figure yeah. into or often figure into uh, yeah. uh, Christian conspiracy theories and far right wing as, as well as the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Mike Shermer had a piece about this in the uh, Wall Street Journal about the uh, apocalypse prediction. Mm. Mike Shermer, of course, is the um, the Skeptic, he runs Skeptic Magazine and uh, has a calm on skepticism for Scientific American. And in this piece in the journal, he came up with a kind of evolutionary psychology um, hmm. explanation of these uh, predictions of apocalypse. And uh, let me just see if this sounds plausible to you. First of all, he's saying that, you know, we, uh, natural selection embedded these uh, pattern detection mechanisms in uh, all of us and that we actually are um, inclined uh, toward detecting patterns that might not be there because our, oh, yeah. our abilities are so exquisitely uh, sensitive, so sometimes we have false positives. He also has a kind of interesting uh, explanation involving looking at um, thinking that there is some sort of intention or agency even behind the passage of time. So he says, we tend to infuse the passage of time with meaning and to see agency in it as well, whether it takes the form of God's supernatural agency in settling moral scores or nature, knocking us off the pedestal of our technological hubris. Apocalyptic visions help us to make sense of an often seemingly senseless world, which hmm. that's good. I guess is... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it totally resonates with me the idea that our brains are wired by evolution to see order and that we see it whether it's there or not, and and, and a lot of times it's difficult to distinguish. Yeah, I, I think what is going to irritate some people is that uh, Mike says that these doomsday scenarios um, or kind of end of the world as we know it scenarios are not unique to religious people. He brings in Marxists as also having a kind of oh, apocalyptic, okay. yeah. apocalyptic view of history and yeah. environmentalists ah, as ah. well. So. Well, I think there may be, be, be something to that on, you know, not, not, all, not environmentalists in general, but there is a certain apocalyptic spirit or something that I think does run through all of us. I mean, look at... Um, you know, back, uh, you know, all, all of the eager anticipation of the uh, 2000, um, you, you, what, what did they call it? The, um, oh, know, where all the computers were supposed to. Y2K. Um, Y2K, yeah. You know, I mean, Y2K, you know, it started out as people warning, like, well, maybe there'll be this problem, you know, where, where, where these computers, you know, won't be able to deal with the, uh, with the change to the millennium from, 1999 to 2000, and we'll have these huge crashes, and this could conceivably bring down the entire international uh, banking system and everything else. And of course, as soon as you say international banking system, it starts getting woven into various plots involving um, <laughs> the Book of Revelation and the Beast, and, and, and the so IMF. there's plenty of that. <laughs> right. but, but 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 also people, you know, people like us, or you know, I'll just speak for myself, people like me anyway. I I, I could really sense and, um, and sort of commune with this idea that, wow, wouldn't that be something if everything really did come down and there was kind of a almost uh, hopeful, ho hopefully, weirdly hopeful anticipation, like, you know, God, things have just become in such a rut and we really need to, something that will really shake things up and, you know, this is probably not something that's going to result in, in mass deaths or anything and... We're too buffered. We're, we're too buffered from too buffered. the yeah. uh, the strangeness yeah. of, of what it, it really is to be alive. Mm. And so we mm. use these uh, 
these artificial means of, uh, mm. of knocking us out of our complacency, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, life is pretty goddamn hard for most people around the world. No, so. I know. It's a, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very elitist thing to come to <laughs> wish for or want. And, 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 and yet, and, then, and I think it was combined with this notion, too, that it's something that would, uh, you know, that wouldn't be really horrible and that it would maybe break down this, this kind of buffer that you mentioned and make people kind of rethink things or like like the effect that you that solar eclipses used to have before people had science yeah yep there's there's uh, but there's still plenty to be terrified of out there without having to make shit up yeah. i mean come on yeah yeah i mean look I at the tsunami and earthquake in japan i mean jesus that was an apocalypse yeah. for yeah Tens yeah. or hundreds of thousands of people, and uh, look at 9/11. That was pretty goddamn apocalyptic. Uh, yeah. look, the the, the oh, world somehow yeah. endures, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't. Have yeah, that's to. what's amazing. How, how um, I mean, not not easily in the short term. You know, there's just just the horrible suffering, but you know, just how in any kind of range, even you know, within a year or two, how how uh, the extent to which these blows become absorbed mm -hmm. you know the resiliency of the system is just I and mean, it really seems remarkable thinking back that destroying the world trade center instantly you know with no warning out of the blue you know didn't cause a collapse of the world economy that we'd still be recovering from right and of course it had horrible effects but but nothing like what you could imagine we humans are a very Vital, weedy species. We are. <laughs> hey, um, I wanted to bring up something. I know I, I want to hear about your trip to England, but I oh, just wanted to bring up sure. something briefly because I think it's yeah. kind of relevant. It's sort of a meta issue. Um, uh, John Brockman, I still get, he's the literary agent who runs this website called edge.org mm -hmm. where um, a lot of people that we know and, and uh, you and I have also hung out and people have these highfalutin dialogues about all sorts of things. Yeah, it's great. It's a great, yeah, it great is. cultural resource. It really is. I wish I participated more. I just didn't do yeah. other things. But, uh, well, he, he said something, and I don't know if you get these emails from him as well, uh, that, um, that was about what's called argumentative theory. Have you? Oh yeah, you mentioned that to me, and I looked at that. I, I and I did look at the posting, the Edge.org posting on that, and that kind of fits in with what we're just now talking about, doesn't it? Yeah, um, it's. And I realized that uh, I don't know how I missed this. Um, it's gotten some at attention. The basic idea, and this comes from um, a couple of different uh, psychologists. Um, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber, and they're basically trying to examine, and this is something that a lot of cognitive scientists and philosophers have, have worried about over the millennia, uh, which is um, why do humans reason as poorly as they do? And these mm -hmm. guys uh, came up with a kind of evolutionary psychology explanation. They were, they were inspired by... Uh, uh, Cosmides and Tubi, who were two gurus of evolutionary psychology, uh, to try to think about human reasoning in evolutionary terms. And what they said is that um, reasoning has never really been about arriving at truth, about trying mm -hmm. to distinguish truth from falsehood and, and providing evidence to tell us uh, what is so and what isn't so. It's really always been about trying to persuade other people that you're right and they're wrong. And yeah. so it's this very kind of, you have to see it in its, its uh, social context. And um, this has gotten a lot of attention. Steven Pinker calls it original, provocative, strikingly re relevant to contemporary affairs. Jonathan Haidt said a paper that these guys did on argumentative theory, one of my favorite papers of the last 10 years, I feel wow. like this is this is what happens with me with, when I see these evolutionary psychology arguments. My first, well, that's, that's a red flag for you. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's it's actually I'm more sympathetic than you might think. My first um, reaction is usually, "Wow, that sounds really interesting and cool and and profound." My second reaction, then when I started reading more about it, was like, 
it's so trivially obvious. Of course, people argue more. That, of course, yeah. arguing is usually more to justify your own preconceived notions yeah. and shoot down yeah. those that challenge it than to arrive at the truth, whatever the hell that is. Yeah, it's like debate, debate, <coughs> debate team reason where. Yeah, you become very good at uh, at rhetoric and persuading people to your cause, and you can see how that would have an evolutionary advantage. And yet, you know, when you know when Isaac Newton sits down and, and, and uses reason to come up with the Principia, I mean, he's tr he's doing both. He's trying to get at the truth, and he's trying to convince people that he has the truth. But then, of course, other scientists, you know, read it, and then there's this back and forth, and people saying, "Oh, will you." You know, I question your assumption here, or this um, particular leap in logic, and and when you get more than like one mind alone, it seems that it um, kind of comes into something that uh, where the purpose is, you know, overall to separate truth and falsity. Right, and and science is designed to overcome, for example, um, what's it called, uh, the uh, confirmation bias, which is a really common problem yeah. with reasoning, where basically you just are out there looking for whatever evidence will support your point of view and ignoring yeah. anything that um, doesn't support it. And science is sort of designed, really, to overcome those sorts of problems. Right. Um, so is the jury system, where right. you have two right. people arguing, obviously, with a very powerful bias on different sides, but you hope that the clash of those two points of view mm. might produce truth or at least some kind of uh, justice according to yeah. this, this piece on the web um, what they call deliberative deliberative democracy uh, also ideally helps overcome um, these sorts of problems because you get um, laws evolving through the clash of, of uh, different points of view and arguing between for example Democrats and uh, Republicans, but as I said, it just, I don't know, I, I thought yeah, it sounded I, really cool at first, and then I thought, it just, like I see, said. It seems obvious, but yeah. Yeah, that's how it struck me, too, and then, you know, I, I haven't read the paper, so so I don't want, don't want to say, and, I, and um, I just get the feeling there must be something more there that I'm missing, if it's being taken, taken as being that uh, original and provocative by someone like Steve Pinker. Mm. Or, well, Steve, or Pinker. Hate, um... Steve Pinker is, uh, remember that he's, he was uh, an acolyte of, of uh, John Tooby and Lena Cosmides, um, you know, the, the sort of uh, gurus of, of uh, evolutionary psychology. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of sort of mutual back scratching that goes along mm -hmm. on when it comes mm -hmm. to these sorts of uh, words. But, uh, but it, it is true that you, I mean, you know, you, you can sort of apply this to um, the refusal a lot of a lot of people to accept uh, human-induced global warming. You can apply it to yeah. um, some of the problems that uh, or the insistence of some people that vaccines cause autism. Mm. You know, all these areas where there, there are people who just refuse to listen to what we think of as a reason, you know, yeah. the nuts who don't think that Barack Obama was actually born in a, in a right. Hawaii. Um, yeah, it, it, well, yeah, and again, the extreme example of that is this conspiracy theory type thinking that, um, you know, was the subject of that Washington Post thing that I, that I participated in, and, um, and these, these doomsday scenarios where, you know, again, certainly it's where you're using so-called reason, you know, to persuade people in a way that's going to be to be to your benefit. With conspiracy theories, it's a little different because it's not necessarily to your benefit, except that most of these people, I think, are kind of, are, are, are indeed trying to draw attention to themselves, yes. the ones that are, you know, cooking up the conspiracy theories, and those that follow it are maybe succumbing to another impulse of you know, really wanting, like, like trying to find order and meaning in the world and just, and it's easy to sympathize with this. I'm trying to find order, meaning, and purpose and just finding a world that, you know, can seem devoid of that. 
Yeah. And then suddenly you have someone who's explaining it all so neatly and so crisply that you can like take out a diagram and just look at boxes connected to boxes and ultimately it's all you know deliberate and planned and the people who are planning it are obviously evil, you know, since the world is such a screwed up place and so people succumb to these these things and you know that of course <sighs> when people write about these sorts of things, so Chris Mooney has wrote about argumentative theory, and Sharon Begley, uh, Chris Mooney, the, the science writer, he wrote about it for Mother Jones. Sharon Begley oh. wrote about it in Newsweek. And, of course, they say, ah, this helps us explain why there are all those uh, religious and right-wing nuts out there who refuse to accept global warming and who have these crazy crazy religious views and, uh, and uh, have conspiracy huh. theories about Barack Obama. So... It also bothers me a little bit that these sorts of meta philosophies about logical yeah. fallacies are always tend to be applied by liberals, leftists to people on the right. <laughs> I happen to agree with them, but it's still kind of I don't know a little bit. Yeah, and I, I still don't see how how I mean. Again, I'm going to read the paper, but at this point, you know, in my shallow knowledge of the subject, it does seem like this is something that was already. I mean, people knew that that reason, like anything else. Well, they didn't know, but I think, you know, many scientists would say that reason is not this platonic thing that exists in some some um, netherworld, and that we somehow a access this this power of you know reason, capital R, to you know come to you know judgments of truth. You know, I think they would agree that it's something that evolved, and it's an ability of the human brain, or it's driven by the human brain's hunger to find order and the survival advantages of finding order and yet there's not necessarily an evolutionary disadvantage to finding too much order yeah and and you know uh, that's not necessarily selected against and this is you know this is kind of the whole theme of of my book fire in the mind this uh, you know our brains are wired to find order and if it's not there we impose it anyway and the curse is often not being able to tell the difference between the real orders and the false orders. And yeah. that, that to me is just kind of the condition of life. And, and philosophy over the last century has been obsessed with trying to uncover logical fallacies and pitfalls in, uh, yeah. in reasoning and even in uh, mathematical logic like um, you know, Gödel's theorem. And mm, uh, right. some of the, uh, you know, the, like the, the liars uh, paradox in, right. in logic and all those sorts of things. So, uh, right. yeah. Yeah, and, um, okay. I, and, and too, there's, there's a difference, too, between flaws in logic, the process, and then in questioning the assumptions. Because anything you believe, any theory, any hypothesis, you know, any uh, religious faith, is built on certain tenets, and there's certain assumptions that you have to take as the bedrock. Because you know, at some point, you know, you can keep reasoning downward and say this happened because of this. But you reach a point where you're either going to go on forever or get into a circle, or you just have to say certain things are fundamental. Like we're going to have this, we're going to have mass and energy interacting in space and time, and and then you derive laws by which this happens, and then. When the laws don't work in some cases, you go back and either redo the laws or make, you know, add little epicycles to the laws. And, and um, you know, you have thousands of minds at any one time, many thousands, working on, on one of these edifices and going back and forth and each competing, you know, argumentatively because they want their ideas to be right. And yet also they're part of a community that as a whole really wants to get at the truth. And... You know, you come asymptotically close to, you know, the best approximation <laughs> that you can. You know, kind of a... I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I, I, you know, as a science journalist, your job really is um, to distinguish um, <clears throat> real truth. I mean, or not even, or, or even just probable statements from bullshit, right? So yeah, how do you do that? Yeah. And, and, and sometimes... And that doesn't happen a lot, yeah. Well, sometimes you are confronted with a set of statements that are um, almost too 
well supported or you know there's a very elaborate logical article with with lots of evidence brought to bear or so forth and i don't know about you but sometimes it it raises suspicions in me and i get at, and i have a kind of intuitive gut sense that there's got to be something wrong with it and then i go looking for what's wrong sometimes yeah, it has to do with yeah. the personality of the person who's saying this and um i, I i'll give you an example of this and I probably prefaced this improperly, but I, I uh, just a few weeks ago, I talked to Gary Taubes, uh, the very distinguished science writer here on Blogging Heads TV, about, oh, yeah, yeah. about his, um, his perspective on obesity and um, overweight and how they are really caused not by just eating too much food or especially by eating too much fatty food, but mm -hmm. by uh, primarily by carbohydrates, by uh, yeah. by sugars, starchy foods, and all those sorts of things. And you know, I've read Gary wrote a gigantic book. Oh, came, I know it's, it's came it's, out a few years ago. Wonderful. Yeah, called Good well, and, 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 and oh, just, just to interrupt for a second, the um, the New York Times Magazine piece that he did a few weeks ago was really excellent. Yeah, on sugar. I I think Gary is. Um, like you know, state of the art science journalism. He's really a smart guy, and he's extremely hardworking. Um, but uh, I just am, you know, his fat thesis. Um, I have always been a little bit suspicious of, even though I brought up the Stevens, I invited him to come on Blogging Heads TV. Um, you know, a lot of it sounds very plausible to me. But uh, one of the things that he suggests is that, and that he does personally, is. Um, is that this, you know, a, a diet that's very low in carbohydrates and very high in fat and meat mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. good for you. And it, it can help you lose a lot of weight, especially if, if um, you're the kind of person who gains a lot of weight on uh, carbohydrates. And, and mm -hmm. Gary describes his diet, which is um, three eggs, and he does this pretty much every day, he said on his blog, mm -hmm. three eggs, um, bacon and sausage, for breakfast, that's his breakfast. Mm. A roast chicken, <laughs> a roast chicken for lunch, and uh, and a, a beef steak for dinner. And then he also wow. has uh, uh, nuts. He said sometimes mm. for uh, for pudding. Okay. Um, oh, I didn't realize how much he'd uh, embodied, so to speak, his his philosophy. Yeah, I didn't either. And I, and to be honest, here again, I, you know, we're talking about logic and evidence and so forth. And I just read that diet. On Gary's blog, and I thought, "Wow, that's gross." You know, that's that's excessive. <laughs> and then I thought, "How can I?" You know, I'm just going to raise doubts about this. It's funny. I, I have to tell the blogging heads people out there that after um, I had this talk with Gary, some of the commenters said Horgan was too nice to his friend here, and there should hmm. have been somebody who was more critical of uh, this very important um, thesis about hmm. obesity and challenge tabs. And so, in part because of those comments, I decided to write a column for Scientific American about my uh, my doubts about the Atkins diet. And I talked oh. about how I consume tons of carbs. I live yeah. on pasta and bread and pizza yeah. and uh, I love French fries. I eat a lot of cake yeah. and muffins and all that kind of good stuff. And um, And I'm a skinny guy. And, uh, yeah, but you also uh, are out there, you know, playing playing killer ice hockey. Yeah, but Gary says exercise makes no difference. That's right. Yeah, he's saying the energy in uh, versus energy out isn't really that important. Right. I I, I personally I, I'm finding his argument very very persuasive. The more I read, I, I can't believe this, but I hadn't read his his, his original um, good calories bad calories until about a year ago. And actually what happened was my um, my editor at Knopf, uh, John Siegel, sent me um, uh, a copy of, um, or maybe it was the galleys, of Gary's, what was then his forthcoming book. And uh, I don't have the title at the top of my head or nearby, but um, you mean that the you're recent basically one kind the, of updating. The recent one or the first one? Yeah, the recent one. The first one is called Good Calories, Bad Calories. The new one is called Why We Get Fat. Why we get fat? Okay, right. Yeah, you'd actually have said that. So yeah, here I actually have you know right here in my my uh, shelf of books that I'm currently referring to regularly as good calories, bad calories, because I started realize, re reading this and first just blown away by the research and 
the effort that went into this, and just slowly realizing this had a lot to do with uh, theories of why people get cancer. And then I just started reading all the sections on cancer, and then looking into just more of this idea that these jolts of sugar upsetting insulin regulation, you know, just just how very plausible it is that this fits in with um, with cancer, which is specifically of interest to me since I'm you know, writing a book on the science of cancer. Yeah. And then when I read his um, uh, his ma magazine article, that just kind of you know made it seem all that more plausible to me. I quit drinking soft drinks after reading Gary's article on oh, sugar. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, it's actually has affected me too because. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really didn't drink soft drinks, or I, I drink like Diet Coke, which, you know, I'm sure is bad for you in other ways, but um, I've never really been a big, you know, big sugar or dessert eater, so I can't say that it's changed changed my behavior too much, but, you know, maybe if the choice, you know, if it comes down to it, and, and I might be on the verge of drinking like a sugary fruit juice or something, I'll say, ah, eh, no, I'll just have a Diet Coke. <laughs> yeah, sugary fruit, fruit juice is, I, Gary says, just as bad. Oh, by the way, I should say that yeah. after my piece came out in Scientific American, Gary wrote me a really irritated email, and then he proceeded to send me, like, I don't know, it seemed like 50 different articles that yeah. that would demonstrate to me what an idiot I am. And oh. um, so then we, we finally talked and kind of made up over the phone. Um, and... Um, but anyway, I just I just wanted to bring that up as a well as an you know, example. I'm glad you did because yeah, can, can I sure. can I uh, can I do a transition off that? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Me, why, why do you finish what you're saying? Well, well I was going to say just just that um, in in our lines of work, I think sometimes we have to be suspicious of overly sophisticated reasoning. I, I have it's it's this yeah. it's this sort of paradoxical effect when I read somebody. Who I feel is like an amazing arguer. Uh, Richard, well, yeah, yeah. Your, your reaction is immediately to find out what's wrong with it. Right. Richard is, Dawkins evokes this in me sometimes. Robert yeah, Wright evokes yeah. it in no, me. No, it's, it's great. Yeah. And you, you know, you're sort of wondering: Are these people trying to, um, you know, is this a snow job that's going on here? Anyway. Yeah. So. so uh, but, well, of course, with Gary, that's. I mean, that's what he was doing with, you know, what seemed to him another snow job, you know, that uh, fat is caused by eating, you know, dietary fat, for example. Right. And, um, and, and the same thing fits in with cancer. There's very little, little uh, reason to believe from, from any epidemiological, really good epidemiological studies that dietary fat has anything much to do with cancer. Right. I mean, maybe a little, but it's not a huge factor. Is how, you know, is what's emerging, and um, and this thing about sugar. You know, last uh, you know, we briefly mentioned that I was in England recently, and it was just about a just about a week or a week and a half ago. I was in London interviewing people for my book, and I was talking to uh, spent like about an hour and a half with the scientist at Imperial College, um, who was the head of the Epic study which is this big, huge epidemiological perspective study where they followed uh, uh, dietary habits in, in um, oh, it's up, oh, God, what is it? I, I didn't know I was going to talk about this, so I don't have my notes at hand, but 300,000-some people, Jesus. and for 20 years, and, you know, this was a perspective study, not one of these, these case control studies that, uh, um, you know, without going into the, to the difference here with a prospective study, you're starting with a bunch of people, in this case, hundreds of thousands, and you're following their health and their dietary habits and other things for 20 years, you know, with regular interviews and compiling all this information. And in addition to that, so I knew about the EPIC study, and coincidentally, I just read a, a fairly recent big report that it did on uh, diet and nutrition, mm -hmm. and um, and that was quite eye-opening. So it was great to have a chance to sit down for an hour and talk to this guy. And toward the end of the interview, he, he brought up this whole uh, sugar connection and just the plausibility that um, that, um, that, re that refined sugar, this huge change in, in the 20 and 21st century diet, um, upset insulin regulation in such a way that... Um, 
you know, and insulin regulation is, is hooked in with estrogen regulation, and estrogen regulation is known to be, you know, a huge factor in, in, in breast cancer and ovarian and endometrial cancer. Right. And um, the impression that I got, got from him was that, you know, there's really a lot of evidence converging to support that, as well as other degenerative diseases. Like, there's all kinds of parallels between diabetes and cancer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in diabetes, you know, again, insulin regulation and sugar, of course, is, you know, just a given. But um, um, so I, I remember walking out of there thinking, wow, this, this stuff that I, I've read from Gary Taubes doesn't sound, sound as fringy as maybe, as maybe I had thought. Oh, it's definitely not fringy. I, I think, but actually I, I pointed this out in my, in my blog post that, I, that um, the evidence of the, the harmful effects of, um, you know, this really refined sugar exemplified mm. by uh, soft drinks. Um, mm. the, the evidence of that makes us fat and can ca cause some of these other problems you mentioned, uh, cancer, seems to be really solid. But that's not s the same as saying that all mm. carbs are bad. And in fact, there are, you know, Gary and I talked a little bit about this, there are especially Southeast Asian populations that have extremely high carbohydrate diets uh, mm -hmm. Because they eat a lot of rice, but they aren't yeah. have drinking. They aren't consuming a lot of this highly processed um, sugar and fructose and so forth. Corn syrup is a, is a yeah. big problem, um, and therefore they don't have problems with obesity. Uh, not yeah. nearly on the scale that we have have them in uh, this country. But that's that's not carbs are bad, fat and meat are good. That's mm -hmm. there's some carbs that are bad and others that aren't so bad, which is which okay. Is yeah, not I mean exactly I. Um... You know, yeah, for me, it's just really, it, it's just, it's specifically the, uh, you know, these, uh, these jolts of, um, of sugar. Yeah. That, that just really, that it's really, uh, I'm finding it persuasive, and it's, you know, something that's been, you know, just changing the way I'm looking at a lot of the studies about cancer. But yeah, as far as complex carbohydrates, that, that I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I can't give up French fries. I just can't. Well, pizza. <laughs> well, I'm not either, you know. But, pizza. But, but, yeah, yeah, but the thing is, you just have to remember, John, when you have fries, to be sure to have it with a quarter pounder with cheese. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you get, you know, you get your balanced. Uh, without the bun. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you could live without those things, those, those <laughs> McDonald's buns. But. Hey, hey, listen, before we run out of time, you gotta, you gotta talk about oh. the, the Templeton thing. Oh, okay, yeah, then this actually ties in, <laughs> coincidentally, this wasn't planned, um, with what we were talking about, two things we were talking about. I, uh, but before I was down in, in London interviewing some cancer researchers, uh, I was up in Cambridge, uh, and I was invited to a Templeton seminar, a week-long seminar on Islam and science, and, um, and this was just really, really great. I... Uh, and, and the reason it was really great is most of the speakers were not only Islamic, but they were from the Islamic world. There was a couple of exceptions, but uh, um, let's see, what was I trying to find? Um, well, I, I won't mention the list, but you know, people like like Bruno uh, Guteroni, the um, astronomer, and um, you know, many other good, interesting people. So. Uh, one thing that came up was, you know, the way that uh, that Muslims use to explain miracles. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of flipping through my notes here, trying to find this term that I'm blanking out on that I had fer heard for the first time. But um, anyway, the idea is, you know, in Christianity, we both went through that Templeton seminar in 2005, mm -hmm. and one thing that kept coming up was uh, people, like scientists who really wanted to, you know, continue to be devout Christians to the extent that they wanted to um, believe in uh, miracles. We have to come up with these ways of how, in a lawful universe, as in laws of physics, lawfulness, you could have miracles occur. Mm -hmm. Which, to me and you, you know, isn't isn't a problem we need to deal with because I think you probably don't believe in miracles either. Mm -mm. Just one big okay, miracle, so, no little miracles. So um, what, what what came up at this conference was uh, well, oh so first in Christianity you know there's this guy John Polkinghorne who who was once a physicist and and then um, and then became a reconciler as in trying to reconcile science and 
in his personal religious beliefs, and he has all this hocus pocus where he will, where the a causality and non locality of quantum mechanics provides a loophole so God can like you know reach in and and do things uh, miraculously when he wants to, mm -hmm. and it turns out that in Islam the big uh, the, the, the dominant theory of that is something called occasionalism. Ah. Do you know that word? No, I like it, though. It's about... <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of not what it sounds, I mean, at least to me. Uh, it's this idea that, that God, during every second or microsecond or micro-microsecond, or, you know, really, God continuously is creating creation. Mm -hmm. You know, the creation is constantly... This dynamic process, and you know, all and this includes the laws of physics, and you know, the the planets going around the sun in a predictable manner, and the and uh, and all that. But then, just because he's doing this every moment, it all works, and science works, and this is all wonderful to the glory of Allah. But at any moment, you know, just for the hell of it, you know, he could do something else. Uh -huh. And to me, it's not. It's kind of a. It's a. I, I was really trying to grapple with how is that different from deism, you know, the Christian idea that once God set the wheels in motion, you know, then, then all it is to do is for us to sit back and study them. Mm -hmm. So it's subtly different, but I, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that, that it, it is interesting. It reminds me of, uh, you know, I teach a little Galileo in my History of Science course, and, ah. uh, and there was this period when... Um, Galileo, he wanted to publish on um, heliocentrism. This is his three dialogues. It ended up being that. And, and beforehand, you know, Galileo, he was a funny guy because he was extremely arrogant because he was almost infinitely smarter than anybody else uh, around him. But he actually was capable of kissing ass strategically. And so, oh, yeah. he, so he tried to suck up to the uh, Pope. I forget if it was Pope uh, Urban or anyway. Um, Urban, I think. Yeah, and, one of the uh, Urbans. And the Pope said, and, and so Galileo you know, said here, I want to uh, teach the controversy. I don't necessarily believe in heliocentrism. Right. Teach the controversy. Teach the controversy. <laughs> uh, you know, so I'm going to talk about geocentrism and then heliocentrism, this interesting alternative. And the Pope said, okay, you can teach both those, but the point I really want you to make is that God can do anything he wants to do. So the Pope didn't necessarily say you've got to make no. sure everybody understands that heliocentrism right. is probably false and geocentrism is probably true. It was more that that science ultimately completely defers to God and God is the one who's controlling everything. And yeah, it was a very sophisticated kind of position. He was saying <laughs> he was saying heliocentrism is just another theory. Right. And it was almost very postmodern. You know, you can have heliocentrism, you can have geocentrism, and these are mechanisms come up, you know, with what but by with come up with by the um, blinkered human brain, right? And 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 that these were great tools and and just a, you know glory to God's creation that He would make brains that could come up with these things, but we shouldn't confuse them for some kind of you know, overriding universe in which God can do anything he wants. Right. Is that well, right? Uh, just, just to, um, for those who aren't familiar with this uh, episode in the history of science, so yeah, Galileo so, wrote the three dialogues, and, and um, of course he had three different characters who represented uh, the three different positions, uh, geocentrism, um, heliocentrism, and then there's a, sort of a, a, a neutral uh, bystander. And, you know, the smart guy... Uh, obviously was standing for uh, uh, for Galileo himself. And then the dummy who believed in heliocentrism, um, his name was uh, Simplicio. And <laughs> right. right at the end of the three dialogues, um, Simplicio has this little speech in which he says, well, you know, both of these models of the solar system are fine, but ultimately we have to acknowledge that uh, it's up to God to decide how the universe works and it was almost right. verbatim what the pope had said had told yeah. galileo to say <laughs> but yeah, it was a total yeah. hor it was a total horgan maneuver but, but, yeah, but, but he put it <laughs> galileo put it in the mouth of simplicio so the pope right, 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 actually right, right. was not a stupid man he was smart enough to realize that he had been mortally insulted 
by yeah, uh, Galileo. Yeah, yeah. And that set all the you know, the Inquisition and all that in uh, in motion. Gilles, that, that's like, great. No, I, it's, I mean, it's such a great story, and and you know, in this this book, uh, Dialogue of the Two Great World Systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is the first really great example of popular science writing yes. that I know about. It's totally readable and just just spellbinding, really. And it was it was argumentative reasoning that actually <laughs> yes. happened to be in yes. the service of truth. Yeah, and yet as an interesting coda, you know. Uh, Galileo kept rebuffing, um, or at least once rebuffed him. Anyway, Galileo rebuffed Kepler with this idea that the planetary orbits have to be elliptical. Really? Thought, I didn't no, know No, they've got to be circles. You know, everyone knows they have to be circles. So really, Galileo's model required um, epicycles, just like Ptolemy's. Oh, is that right? I thought Galileo absorbed uh, Kepler's elliptical. No, uh, Galileo was a circle man. Huh. Yeah, everything had to be circles. It just seemed obvious to him. So again, you know, there was there was that assumption that he didn't um, didn't question. And um, it's a fascinating history. And actually, this came up at the Islam and science thing that I went to um, because uh, Owen Gingrich was there, ah. who's one of my favorite people. He's a historian of science, retired from Harvard, and I got to know him when I was writing Miss Levitt's Stars about Henrietta Levitt, the um, human computer at Harvard Observatory who around in the early years of the 20th century discovered the the method with Zephyr variables that we still use to measure huge distances in space. Mm -hmm. But so Owen was there and there's nothing better than walking around Cambridge with Owen because he knows every little secret shortcut and back alley and he has all these wonderful stories because uh -huh. he collects uh, he collects uh, scientific manuscripts. He has a second edition of Copernicus's De, Re De Revolutionibus. And he was Jesus. telling me some amazing story about, about some recent forgeries of a Galileo manuscript that came up on the market. And, and um, anyway, uh, regaling us with all this wonderful stuff. But during the seminars, he kept persisting with this one question. You know, he'd go back to Galileo and he'd say, at this time, you know the the you know lens making you know was a you know well developed craft and, and the same types of lenses that Galileo used to make his telescope were being exported with great regularity to the Arabic world. Mm -hmm. This is apparently historians have gone back and established this. So Owen kept kind of you know impishly asking, so why then you know in the West do we get Galileo in people you know other people. Had, done this to a much lesser extent, you know, putting together a telescope and then using it to look at the sky and, and discovering that, wow, lo and behold, there are craters on the moon. It's not this perfect, pristine surface like you'd expect from a, from a, you know, a godly orb. And, 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 and how can there be, be little planet-looking things going around Jupiter and, um, you know, all this stuff that, you know, fit into his his theory of um, heliocentrism. So Owen asks, so all this happens in Europe with Galileo. The same lenses are available in, um, in the Arabic world, and yet they don't come up with, they don't do anything with them. Oh. And they'll make a you know, very provocative question. And, um, Were the Muslims you know, course, getting irritated to, at this point? Uh, they, 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 some of, there were speakers who seemed a little bristled. And um, I, mean, I mean, the good thing about this was they gave a real counter view to this notion that comes up a lot in, in um, you know, that um, the scientific revolution was, you know, grew, grew out of uh, Protestant Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of strong arguments to be made for that, but it was a great reminder of the glories of Islamic science, you know, which was, you know, every bit as, as creative and wonderful until it went into this uh, dark ages, mm -hmm. its own equivalent of a dark ages, just as as the West did, but um, no, this argument just kept going back and forth, and it was just really, really fascinating. Oh, I'm envious, George. That sounds like it uh, must have been fun. Were there any of our um, our buddies from 2005 there? Oh, let's see. Kathy Grossman was there. Ah, Michael Brooks. Uh, USA Today religion reporter, and uh, yeah, let's see. Martin Redfern. Michael Martin was there, yeah. You know, Martin, Martin Redfern, BBC science editor. You know, he he, he does the sound on all those too, as well as as participate with them. And 
Oh, let's see. So there's Kathy and Martin. Oh, and there was a there, there was someone you know, uh, Martin Levin. Uh, yes. Globe and Mail, Toronto. Oh yeah, I've never, I've never yeah. met him. Yeah, but he's he spoke uh, very, very, very highly of you. Well, he's he's um, he's uh, he's a good guy. He's yeah, he's I've done a I don't know four or five pieces for the Globe and Mail. Yeah, he was him. great. Yeah, real total skeptic. So uh -huh. yeah, so it was a lot of fun. It was one of these you know great things where we got to you know dine at Trinity College one night and Gonville and Keys at another. So. It kind of made me think again what life might have been like if I'd looked beyond the University of New Mexico. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I'm I'm um, I'm thinking good thoughts about science journalism. I, I just wrote a piece uh, column for Scientific American. I guess it'll come out last week about um, going to the graduation of the Columbia Journalism School where I went oh. eons ago, and um, you know I give out this award for science journalism and. And, uh, you know, we spend so much time worrying about our profession and how can people make a living anymore and, and um, you know, journalism as a whole, but especially dry science journalism um, it has fallen on hard times, I think it's fair to say, and it's not clear how it's going to evolve in the future. And, but then I, I, you know, I get all these submissions for this award and... Uh, and these were the best submissions ever. The the quality of the writing and the reporting wow. and everything was so amazing. I mean, really wow. impressive, That's great. very professional. That's and, great. And these are people who really obviously see science as an extremely, and when I say science, I mean science, medicine, technology. Uh, they see it as really important um, to uh, society, and, and there are you know downsides as well as upsides, and so they were investigating different aspects of science and, and uh, medicine. Um, and it really it made me feel um, feel good about things, just for a wow. moment. That's great. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But this is, just, this is not, I don't know that I know about this award. I know about the Green Book Award. That... Yeah, this is why, it's funny, I feel a little awkward talking about it, because it's actually called the John Horgan Science Journalism Award. Wow. Um, and it, it's, I didn't, it, puts up, gives serious money to these kids every year. I didn't put the money up. My dad was so thrilled that I ended up uh, abandoning my life as a shiftless hippie and becoming oh. a uh, science writer back in the early 80s that he um, actually in the late 90s put up the, uh, the money for this award, and it's been going wow. for 12 years now. Oh, I, somehow I missed out on that. Yeah, well... I mean, not not missed out on winning it, missed out on even knowing about it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it was, uh, and it, as I said, just going and seeing all these smart young people who want to become journalists of any kind. Yeah. In this climate was, I don't know, it made me uh, just, it made me feel upbeat. That's great. Well, to add to the uh, the enthusiasm. <laughs> And, and optimism. Ten days from now, we'll be having our 16th annual Santa Fe Science Writing Workshop. Right. And we got a record number of applicants this wow, year. Wow, that's just. So we have 50 people coming to this week-long workshop. We have 10 people on the waiting list. We have, you know, as usual, we have uh, someone from the UK, and this time we also have. Um, uh, someone from Japan and a woman coming um, all the way from Hyderabad, India. Wow. All these people into science writing, so we're going to you know, sit around and, and talk about that for, for five days in Santa Fe. Jesus, that's, um, it's, it's fascinating and, uh, I, I don't know, strangely... Pleased. I mean, only a, you know, only a portion of the people who, who come through the workshop end up you know, establishing niches of science writers, but... Um, you know, a lot of them do, and, and a lot of just amazingly good freelance niches yeah. you know, where they have like five or six different publications they regularly contribute to, to for the bread and butter stuff, and then, uh, and then um, you know, working on longer projects. And, and also people that just go back to, um, you know, maybe just appreci they, they appreciate what, um, what we're doing you know, more than they might have in the past. Because we get a lot of scientists, especially young postdocs coming out of the uh, biological sciences who just realize that they don't really want to be bench scientists. Right. And, but they're fascinated by science and they're fascinated by the ideas and, and some of them have a flair for writing and, and you know, just want to 
want to explore the, the possibilities. Well, they're lucky to have found your program and to, well, they get to hang out and to have something. you as a mentor. <laughs> well, you've been a mentor too, so we, we need to have you back. Oh, anytime. Yeah. Okay, it's a deal. All right, I think we're, uh, we made it through another hour and four minutes. Yeah, we didn't get to everything we wanted to talk about, so we should do this uh, sooner than later. All right, maybe so after your... I wanted to talk about some really, really good columns you had in uh, Scientific American and, and in the Chronicle for Higher Education. Okay, well, you know, you let me know. You're, you've got, uh, maybe after your your um, Yeah, after the or... workshop, yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, that's that's probably, that, that, yeah, because I'll, I'll be tied up all week. Not next week, but the following week with that, so... All right, but it's it's good to talk to you again, George. John, you too. So I will see you soon. All right, take it easy. Okay.